World Championship Wrestling may have touted itself as the place where the big boys play, but it was those under 6 feet tall and weighing less than 220 pounds that routinely gave viewers the best match of the night. The Cruiserweight Championship came along in 1996 as a way to give some of the best smaller wrestlers from America, Japan, Mexico and beyond something to fight over and, very quickly, it became a highlight of the Monday Night Wars. Just a few short years later, things would be very, very different. Following the the collapse of WCW, the title would migrate over to WWE, where it would at times come to symbolize creative inconsistency and general apathy, but there were also flashes of brilliance too. Needless to say, in the 11-year two-promotion history of the Cruiserweight title, there were high highs and low lows. And that makes ranking the 36 people to have held the title just that much more difficult. So, just so you know, we are only looking at the classic lineage that stretches from 1996 to 2007 here, not the Cruiserweight title WWE introduced in 2016. And just so we're clear, our countdown will take into account reigns and days as officially recognized by WCW and or WWE. So, with that out the way, let's see how these high-flying lads and lasses stack up, eh? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WCW and WWE Cruiserweight Champion ranked from worst to best. Join us! Number 36, Oklahoma. Jesus Christ, what a way to get this thing going. For those of you who don't remember Oklahoma or simply don't know who the hell that is, all I can say is, good for you. Oklahoma was a mean-spirited parody of legendary announcer Jim Ross, portrayed by former WWE writer Ed Ferrara. Evidently, Ferrara and his partner in crime Vince Russo held a grudge against good old JR from their time in the company and used WCW television to air their grievance with a hurtful and frankly deeply unfair funny impersonation. Since title belts didn't mean much to Russo and Ferrara, they're just props bro, it wasn't any skin off their backs to give one to Oklahoma, who beat Medusa to bag Cruiserweight gold that sold out 2000, having stolen the belt in the build-up. The low point of a very bad show, the match was basically Medusa beating up the heel commentator for a couple of minutes before Oklahoma stole the win with a poorly executed schoolboy. His reign lasted all of two days as he vacated it on the next edition of Thunder due to exceeding the division's weight limits. Having relived this whole lamentable episode, I can honestly say I would love to slobber knock both Russo and Ferrara out. By God! Number 35, Hornswoggle. Hornswoggle has his detractors, but you cannot deny the character was extremely over during points of his WWE career. And that's probably why the company made the call to give him the Cruiserweight title. Swoggle's championship triumph was a surprise, as he wasn't officially entered into the Cruiserweight Open at the 2007 Great American Bash. Chavo Guerrero was defending against Funaki, Jamie Noble, Jimmy Wang Yang, and Shannon Moore when the little bastard emerged from under the ring, climbed to the top rope and hit Noble with a tadpole splash to become champ. His reign consisted of two televised title defenses against the Redneck Messiah on two episodes of SmackDown. The first was a totally comedic affair, obviously, which the Leprechaun won by countout. The second one wasn't even a match because Noble and I kid you not got trapped inside a giant box backstage and didn't make it to the ring in time to compete, resulting in another countout loss. Three weeks later, the Cruiserweight title was deactivated by by SmackDown general manager Vicky Guerrero owing to the recent revelation that Hornswoggle was Mr. McMahon's illegitimate son. I hate wrestling sometimes. Number 34, Medusa. With a reputation built on hard-fought matches in WWE and overseas in Japan, Medusa had the credibility to legitimately be considered a contender for something like the Cruiserweight Championship. Unfortunately, WCW towards the end of 1999 forgot the meaning of the word credibility, and the former Alundra Blaze's reign was just another sad nail in the once-proud title's coffin. Medusa became the first female cruiserweight champion in history by defeating Evan Courageous at Starcade. While champ, she would score a victory over Buzzkill and defended her title against a planted fan in a match on WCW Saturday Night, China Ripoff Asia, and Oklahoma in an evening gown match before losing it to him at Sold Out 2000. Number 33, Psychosis. Psychosis was one of the best cruiserweights in WCW history and had count great matches with a wide variety of opponents. So, you might be asking yourself, what the hell is the two-time Cruiserweight Champion doing all the way down 
down at number 31. Though he held the belt twice, neither of the masked man's reigns were memorable. In fact, one of them barely even counts as a reign to begin with. The first one at least began well, with a victory in a long and entertaining four-way match against then-champion Rey Mysterio, Juventud Guerrera, and Blitzkrieg on the April 19, 1999 episode of Nitro. Sadly for Psychosis, though, he lost the title back to Mysterio a week later. Psychosis was then simply awarded the title on the October 4th edition of Nitro after Turner Broadcasting forced the removal of then-champion Lenny Lane's controversial character. He immediately failed in his first defense against Disco Inferno. With two reigns clocking in at a total of six days, Psychosis is second bottom in combined days only to Oklahoma. Ouch. Number 32, Crowbar. 90s indie standout Devon Storm finally received a break during the dying days of WCW as Crowbar. He, along with Daphne, were one of the highlights of WCW programming at a time where there really weren't that many highlights at all. His run as Cruiserweight Champion, however, was not something to write home about. Crowbar won the belt by teaming with Daphne to defeat then-champion Chris Candido and Tammy Sitch in a mixed tag match on the May 15, 2000 edition of Nitro. It was a classic, though only because Miss Hancock decided to come out and do a little dance towards the end of the contest. But because this is WCW and nothing could ever be straightforward, Crowbar and Daphne, who rolled up Sitch for the three, became co-champions. And then Ric Flair came out and chopped Crowbar out of the ring to show you what an afterthought this title belt really was. Number 31, Daphne. A week later on Nitro, Daphne and Crowbar decided to settle things once and for all in a match to determine who would be the sole cruiserweight champion. When a thumb war and a couple of rounds of rock, paper, scissors wouldn't work, they began wrestling proper, leading to such high spots as an, oh, let me check my notes here. Ah yes, an atomic wedgie. In fairness, Daffers did hit a pretty sweet diving top rope Hurricane Rana, or Frankenscreamer if you will, immediately afterwards. And that was the high point, as soon after Candido and Sitch made their presence felt, giving us the requisite catfights and ending with no gimmicks needed, missile drop kicking a chair into Crowbar's face, before planting him with a sit-out tombstone pile driver on the steel. Yup, that'll do it. While trying to revive her partner, Daphne accidentally covered Crowbar and won the title for herself. She held it for two more weeks, notching one successful defense against Candido and the artist when Sitch inadvertently cost her man before dropping it to Lieutenant Loco, aka Chavo Guerrero, in a three-way also involving Disco Inferno. Number 30, Jacqueline. The third woman to win the Cruiserweight Championship and the first to do so in WWE, Jacqueline snagged the prize by answering Chavo Guerrero's open challenge on the May 6, 2004 edition of SmackDown. She defended it against Chavo and Jamie Noble on house shows, but fell in her first televised defense after losing a non-title match to Chavo Guerrero Sr., aka Chavo Classic. In his official rematch, Chavo Jr. agreed to have one arm tied behind his back when he wrestled Jackie at Judgment Day. It was a gimmicky match that they did their best with and ended when Chavo untied the string behind the referee's back and hit the gory bomb to reclaim the title. I'm not entirely sure what the whole point of this experiment was, to be honest, especially since Jacqueline was released from her contract very soon after. I suppose it was just another accomplishment for the Hall of Famer's CV, if nothing else. Number 29, Evan Courageous. Prior to becoming a member of Three Counts, Evan Courageous was a man who basically helped make up the numbers on the WCW roster and was primarily used to put others over. Then a certain head writer came aboard, bro, and must have seen something in him. Because it was Russo's call to give Courageous his very first WCW title, and it was also his call to have Perry Saturn beat Courageous in 90 seconds the very next night. One defense against the maestro on a house show was all Evan could muster before he did the honors for Medusa at Starcade. Number 28, Shinjiro Atani. The first ever WCW Cruiserweight Champion won the title by beating Wild Pegasus Chris Benoit in a supposed tournament final match on a New Japan Pro Wrestling show. A one-match tournament it was. Grueling, eh? To be fair, it was an absolute belter of a match and well worth tracking down if you can find it. But although the Cruiserweight title was birthed with a classic match, it wasn't followed up with a classic reign. Because Otani, a very unique and gifted performer who had turned heads with his performance opposite Eddie Guerrero at WCW Starcade 1995, hopped on a plane to drop it to Dean Malenko in his very first defense 42 days later. On an episode of WCW Worldwide, no less. Yep, they couldn't even be bothered to book it for night 
Nitro. Thankfully, the belt's reputation would grow significantly from then on. Number 27. Chavo Classic Days after Chavo Jr. regained his belt from Jackie, his old man won it on an episode of SmackDown in a triple threat match also featuring Spike Dudley. Essentially in there to try and help his son retain, Classic accidentally fell backwards on his boy and unknowingly won the match and the gold. A tremendous worker in his prime and the man credited with popularizing the moonsault, Chavo Guerrero Sr. was a much more comedic figure at this stage in his career. And he was genuinely funny too, growing more egocentric by the week now that he once again held a title. Classic defended the title on house shows and managed two televised defenses before losing to Rey Mysterio after a 27 day run. His reign may have been longer had he not managed to no-show a pair of house shows. That lack of professionalism not only curtailed his cruiserweight title reign, but earned him his pink slip too. Number 26. Mike Sanders Mike Sanders liked to claim he was above average, but maybe he should tell that to his WCW cruiserweight title reign, because it was a bit crap, you know? As WCW commissioner, Sanders engineered a situation where he could win the title by beating Elix Skipper in a handicap power bomb to win only match in which he teamed with Kevin Nash. Sanders was a decent enough hand in the ring, but he was also really rather bland, and matches with Lance Storm and Kiwi, his only two defenses during a 62-day reign, didn't set the world on fire. To be fair, WCW was such a mess at this time, and nothing really made sense. Let alone the fact that Sanders was 10 whole pounds over the division's supposed weight limit. Number 25. Lance Storm If I could be serious for just a minute, Lance Storm, like Sanders, Sanders doesn't look like your typical cruiserweight, does he? Even though he could fly around the ring hitting springboards and pinpoint dropkicks with the best of them, Storm was a little bulkier than the majority of those in the division. Lance defeated Lieutenant Loco on the July 31st 2000 Nitro to add the cruiserweight title to the US and hardcore belts he was already in possession of, making him a triple champion. He only managed one defense of the cruiserweight title, which he renamed the 101 kilogram and under title, beating Juventu Guerrero on an episode of Thunder before he simply awarded it to Team Canada teammate Elix Skipper, ending his reign at 13 days. Storm could have been a great cruiserweight champion, but it just wasn't going to happen at this point of time in the company. Number 24, Chris Candido. WCW felt like last chance saloon for Chris Candido following an inconsistent spell in the Fed and an ECW run that ended in acrimony. It was heartening then to see WCW creative show faith in Mr. No Gimmicks Needed by putting the cruiserweight title on him at Slamboree 2000. Candido won the belt in a six-way after it was made vacant in that big company-wide reboot by Bischoff and Russo. A pay-per-view defense against the artist and one on Thunder against Crowbar was all she wrote before he lost it to Crowbar and Daphne in the aforementioned mixed tag with Tammy Sitch. Had the former body donner been around in, say, 96 or 97, you would have put money on him having a much better run and much better matches with stronger opponents. As it is, his time in W. WCW came just a little late and ended just a month after he lost the belt. Number 23, Alex Wright. Though he never quite got the same credit that a lot of his contemporaries did, Alex Wright was an important player in the golden age of WCW's cruiserweight division. The dancing German gained a cult following due to his moves on the mat and his moves before and after his matches. That popularity, as well as his penchant for always putting in a solid shift, were rewarded with a brief title reign in the summer of 1997. Wright beat Chris Jericho on the July 28th edition of Nitro and then defended the belt against Scotty Riggs twice before he retained it against Jericho at Road Wild in a decent match. Three days later, however, Jericho got his win back and ended Wright's sole reign at 18 days. Not one to sit around and mope, he rebounded by defeating Ultimo Dragon for the television title at a Clash of the Champions special just five days after his loss to Jericho aired. Thus is good, ya? Yeah? Number 22, Lenny Lane. Lenny Lane, there is a wrestler with a title belt. He is the best to ever hold it, don't you know? You can win, it's on the Thunder Show. But will your own reign be good? I'd say no. <clears throat> he may not have filled the shoes of the man who held it before him, but Lenny Lane's run as cruiserweight champion wasn't actually half bad. Wasn't necessarily half good either, but not a total train wreck or anything. After shockingly beating Rey Mysterio to win the gold, Lane defended it against Juventud Guerrera, Billy 
Billy Kidman, Kaz Hayashi, El Dandy, Shaggy 2 Dope, and Evan Courageous. Lenny, alongside his West Hollywood blonde's tag partner Lodi, were then hastily taken off of television after Glad took umbrage with their gimmick, which they considered offensive and homophobic. He had been scheduled to drop his title to Disco Inferno, but WCW wanted to get him off TV ASAP and simply had Psychosis do it instead. Number 21, Kid Cash. Did you know that Kid Cash only made the one appearance for WCW, showing up on the very final edition of WCW Thunder just days before the company was bought by WWE? Because he bloody did, you know? The former ECW World Television Champion wasn't signed by Vince McMahon's organization until 2005, after he had spent many years as an anchor of TNA's X Division. It didn't take Cash too long to find success in WWE, as he beat Humantu Guerrero to win the Cruiserweight title at Armageddon. He would defend it in multiple triple threat matches with Jamie Noble and Funaki on house shows, and managed to beat Hoovy in their rematch on SmackDown, which was the Juice's final WWE outing. Clearly, the company didn't feel as though Cash was was working out as champ because he lost it to surprise entrant Gregory Helms in a Texas Tornado six-way invitational at the 2006 Royal Rumble. He never received a straight rematch and instead opted to focus on the doubles division and his budding Pitbulls tag team with Noble. His dead-level brain buster finisher was cool and he was a new face in a stagnant division, but Kid Cash's cruiserweight title run was not one for the ages. Number 20, Disco Inferno. If there is one thing I hate, it's Glenn Gilberti. But to be fair to him, he wasn't the absolute worst cruiserweight champion or anything like that, and for spells during his WCW career was actually an entertaining mid-card distraction. There, I said it, alright? Disco had some tough acts to follow, and Lenny Lane, when he beat Psychosis to win the title on the October 4th, 1999 edition of Nitro. He defended it a few times on television against Kaz Hayashi, Evan Courageous, and Vampiro, with the highlight of his 49-day run being a Halloween Havoc encounter with Lash LaRue. Courageous was the man to take it from him at Mayhem, starting that disastrous Russo-fied period where the strap lost a lot of its luster. Number 19, Nunzio. Nunzio might have never become cruiserweight champion had Paul London not managed to piss off Vince McMahon to the point that a switch was hastily booked for an episode of Velocity of all shows. The full-blooded Italian defended the title mostly on house shows in multi-man matches and only managed two defenses on television, one against Jimmy Jacobs and an eight-second win over an enhancement guy, both of which took place on Velocity. Also, while champion, our man found himself on the losing end of various non-title singles matches and tag bouts with partner Vito. Hey, at least he lost it in a featured pay-per-view match, though, doing the favors for Juventud Guerrero at No Mercy 2005 and ending his reign at 64 days. A month later, the former Little Guido got a second bite of the cherry when he beat Juvi for the title at a non-televised house show in Rome. He then defended it against Guerrero all over Europe before losing it back to Juventud at a SmackDown taping in Sheffield. A reign to forget about, for sure. Number 18, The Artist. After Oklahoma's fat ass vacated the title, it was put up for grabs in a tournament, concluding at Super Brawl 2000. The artist formerly known as Prince Iakea, a reference to pop megastar Prince that you really had to be there to get, brushed past Kid Romeo and Kaz Hayashi before upending Lash LaRue. It was not a great tournament, let me tell you. Defenses against La Parker, Crowbar, Chavo Guerrero, and David Flair, really? Were not high-caliber outings, but the artist seemed to be having fun with the gimmick at least. A victory over Psychosis in the opener of the Dire Uncensored was probably the highlight of a reign that also rather pointlessly saw him drop the title to Kidman for a day at a house show. Speaking of pointless, the artist's reign came to a rather pointless conclusion when Bischoff and Russo stripped the entire roster of their titles as part of their company-wide reboot. Looking back at the artist's combined 47 days as champ really begs the question, just how did WCW manage to avoid getting sued over that Purple Rain rip-off theme music? Moving on. Number 17, Elix Skipper. A product of WCW's power plant training facility, Elix Skipper was another young up-and-comer who did everything he could to make an impression as the company was circling the drain. As we saw a little earlier, Primetime didn't exactly win the title in the most convincing way since he was handed it by Lance Storm. But the Team Canada member did his best with what he was literally just given, defending it on television against Kiwi, Lieutenant Loco, a young Chris Harris, Corporal Cajun, and once again against Kiwi at the Fall Brawl 2000 pay-per-view. 
2. To show just how much WCW valued Skipper and the Cruiserweight, or should that be 101 kilogram and under title, it should be noted that during this reign he lost several non-title matches, including a handicap match lost he and Storm suffered at the hands of Goldberg. Elix lost the title in a peculiar way too, when Mike Sanders was put in charge of the October 2nd 2000 edition of Nitro, booked himself against Skipper for the title and then changed the match to a handicap match teaming with Kevin Nash, also changing the rules so that you could only win via powerbomb in what was really an angle disguised as a match. Number 16, Ultimo Dragon. J Crown Champion Ultimo Dragon, sometimes spelled Ultimate Dragon by WCW, had several stabs at the Cruiserweight title before he defeated Dean Malenko at Starcade 1996 in a match where his J Crown of titles was also on the line. This, if nothing else, gave us the wonderful visual of the masked man holding a frankly ludicrous number of belts. Ultimo defended the cruiser strap against Jushin Liger and then Malenko on Nitro, as well as Mark Starr on WCW Pro, before the Iceman won it back at a Clash of the Champions special, ending his reign at 24 days. That was Dragon's first reign, however, as he shockingly beat Eddie Guerrero in a very quick match on the December 29th, 1997 episode of Nitro to begin reign number two. A longer, more distinguished reign would not be in his future, as WCW felt the need to have a title change on the debut episode of Thunder, and Juventud Guerrero took it off him after holding it for just nine days. For the quality of a couple of his matches while in possession of the title alone, Ultimo finds himself higher up in this list than his combined number of days as champ may otherwise suggest. Number 15, Funaki. Funaki may have been SmackDown's number one announcer, but he was not the greatest cruiserweight champion of the era. To be fair, WWE's interest level in pushing the division had hit rock bottom by the time the former Kai and Tai member beat Spike Dudley at Armageddon 2004. Presented as a major upset, fans sadly reacted with indifference rather than joy. Credit to Funaki, though, who was very much a fighting champion. Defenses against the likes of Spike, Nunzio, and Chavo Guerrero varied in length and quality, while he defended it mainly in triple threats and four ways on the road at house shows. Funaki didn't move any mountains as champion but the Cruiserweight title was very much an unwanted distraction for the creative team at the time. At No Way Out 2005, Funaki lost the title in a gauntlet match when he was the first person eliminated by Paul London. A 69-day run ended in 90 seconds. Number 14, Spike Dudley. If ever a WWE star fit the term Cruiserweight, it was the diminutive Spike Dudley. The run to the Dudley litter added the Cruiserweight title to his WWE Hall of Tag Team and Europe European gold when he turned heel and joined back up with Bubba and Devon. The Dudleys helped their kin defeat Rey Mysterio on the July 29th, 2004 edition of SmackDown, kicking off a run that saw Spike take on a new role as leader of their clan. He successfully defended the title on television and pay-per-view against the likes of Paul London, Nunzio, Funaki, Mysterio, and Scotty Too Hotty. In one of his reign's highlights, Spike fended off Mysterio, Chavo Guerrero, and Billy Kidman in the frenetic opener of Survivor Series. He was in the midst of a memorable reign, but when Bubba and Devon were taken off television, it felt like WWE gave up on Spike a little bit and made the call to have him drop the strap to Funaki at Armageddon. A not too shabby 135 days as champ for Little Spike Dudley, the sixth longest reign in the title's history. Number 13, X Pac. Sean Waltman is one of a handful of people who held the Cruiserweight title in both WCW and WWE. The New World Order member began his first reign by defeating Dean Malenko in the opener of Super Brawl 1997. He defended it on television against Prince Iakea, Mysterio, Juventud, Jericho, and Chavo Guerrero Jr., before losing it to Jericho on a house show of all places 124 days in. The house show was broadcast over the internet as Sunday Nitro, by the way. Six, as he was known at the time, did manage to rack up a decent amount of defenses and his in-ring work was always tip-top, but it did feel a little bit like other NWO business took priority over the title most of the time. As X-Pac, he won the Cruiserweight title by beating Billy Kidman on the July 30th, 2001 episode of Raw in a match where his own light heavyweight title was also there for the taking. He actually lost the light heavyweight title to Tajiri 
theory a week on, but won it back 13 days later at SummerSlam in a match where once again both titles were on the line. He mainly defended the Cruiserweight belt on house shows and managed one more defense of the light heavyweight title on Raw against Scotty Too Hotty, before losing his Cruiserweight gold to the man he had initially beaten for it, Billy Kidman, on the October 11th SmackDown. The light heavyweight title was removed from television when Waltman suffered an injury before being deactivated in early 2002 and properly replaced by the Cruiserweight title. Number 12. Matt Hardy in his bid to distinguish himself as a single star in his own right away from brother Jeff, Matt Hardy moved from Raw to SmackDown and began an interesting new gimmick as Virgin One. Aided by his MFR, that's Mattitude follower, Shannon Moore, Hardy began desperately trying to lose weight in early 2003 in order to qualify for a shot at the Cruiserweight title. He barely made it under the 215 pound threshold in time to take on and defeat Billy Kidman at No Way Out. Kidman couldn't get the title back from Matt, nor could Funaki, Brian Kendrick, or Rey Mysterio who failed in his bid in the opener of WrestleMania 19. Away from television, the sensei of Mattitude defended the gold on house shows against all comers. It was on television, however, that Matt had not just his most important defense, but perhaps the most significant cruiserweight title match, at least in its WWE iteration, to that point. Because on the June 5th, 2003 episode of SmackDown, Hardy put the title on the line against Rey Mysterio in the show's main event. It was the first time the championship had ever main evented a televised show, and it would also prove to be end of the line for Matt, as Mysterio managed to roll him up and win the title in front of his family who were watching on from ringside. Number 11. Paul London Paul London was a very good cruiserweight champion who held the title with pride and could have been a great one had WWE been bothered with the division at the time. London bagged the gold in a seven-person battle royal on the March 31st, 2005 episode of SmackDown, last eliminating his former partner Billy Kidman to win his first and only WWE singles title. He defended it against Kidman in a singles match that was much more compelling than it probably ought to have been due to London suffering a hard way cut and bleeding profusely not long into it. He also routinely defended it on house shows, including in a battle royal on a European tour in which he accidentally eliminated himself and would have lost the title if not for a hasty restart, before entering into a feud with Chavo Guerrero. That saw a very solid defense at Judgment Day and another couple on SmackDown. The arrival of the Mexicals seemed to signal that London's time with the title may soon be coming to an end, but he rather surprisingly lost it to Nunzio on an episode of Velocity ending his sole reign at 127 days. Reports at the time say the decision to do so was made after London confronted Vince McMahon about the poor treatment of the cruiserweight division and title, as well as the boss's decision to ban top rope moves like the 450 splash and shooting star press. Number 10, Juventud Guerrera. One of the most impressive luchadors to sign for WCW, Juventud Guerrera counts himself as a five-time former cruiserweight champion with three reigns for the Turner backed organization and two during his brief stay in WWE. Brief is the key word here, really, because the Juice never had that one long substantial reign to bump him up higher on our list. His first reign began on the debut episode of Thunder, where he defeated Ultimo Dragon. That lasted all of a week and won defense against Rey Mysterio on Nitro before Rey took the gold from him on the second episode of Thunder. Hoovy's second reign started at Road Wild 98, where he beat Chris Jericho. He defended on Nitro, Thunder, and Saturday Night against a wide variety of competitors, from Kidman, Silver King, and Tokyo Magnum, to Evan Courageous, Psychosis, Kaz Hayashi, and Hector Garza. He lost it to Kidman in a great match, then won it back from him 62 days later. Unfortunately, one defense was all he managed, before Kidman took it back at World War III. Hoovy held the title for 58 days total in WWE, his two runs interrupted by a nine-day, mostly non-televised Nunzio reign. He might have held it for longer had the headaches he caused backstage not convinced WWE to switch the title to Kid Cash at Armageddon 2005, just weeks before push came to shove and WWE decided to shove him away for good. Number 9. Jamie Noble It didn't take Jamie Noble too terribly long to make a splash on WWE's main roster. Foster. In his first televised match on SmackDown, the former Young Dragon beat Billy Kidman to become the number one contender to the Cruiserweight Championship. 
Then, just a few days later, he beat the Hurricane at the 2002 King of the Ring to win the title. Noble, alongside girlfriend slash manager Nidia, were one of the true highlights of the blue brand at this time, and the pair were a riot in segments and interviews. Inside the squared circle, the redneck messiah retained against Chavo, Kidman, Hurricane, Tajiri, Shannon Moore, and Crash Holly. Add to that pay-per-view defenses against Kidman and the Japanese Buzzsaw, as well as a triple threat match with Tajiri and Mysterio at the UK exclusive Rebellion, and you have the makings of quite the run with a belt that had become exclusive property of SmackDown following the draft split. Noble brought a believable and intense ground-based style that blended nicely with his more high-flying contemporaries. It was against one of the highest flyers that he eventually lost the title when he succumbed to Kidman's shooting star press at Survivor Series. Number 8. Eddie Guerrero Eddie Guerrero capturing the Cruiserweight title coincided with his growing confidence as a heel in WCW and move up the card. Previously a rather bland but still entertaining babyface, Eddie's attitude adjustment helped him defeat Chris Jericho in a thriller at Fall Brawl 1997 to win the title for the first time. He was defending it the very next night against Ultimo Dragon on Nitro and also saw off Mysterio, Ultimo One More Time, Psychosis and Chris Benoit before putting his belt on the line against against Ray's mask at Halloween Havoc. There, in one of the best WCW matches ever, as well as one of the best in the careers of Guerrero and Mysterio, and consider just how high that bar is, Ray beat Eddie to win the championship and keep his mask. Guerrero's first reign had ended at 41 days. Two weeks later, however, Eddie beat Ray on Nitro to regain the title. Malenko, Mysterio, and another corker at World War III, Louis Spicoli, and Bobby Blaze couldn't get it off him, and he appeared to be just hitting his stride when Ultimo Dragon put an end to his 48 day reign in a surprisingly short bout on Nitro. He may not have held it the longest, but nobody could touch Guerrero when it came to in ring work at this particular time, and he stuffed many impressive defenses into his time with the gold. Number 7. Tajiri Alright, if nobody else is going to say it, allow me. Yoshihiro Tajiri is one of the most underrated professional wrestlers ever. The former ECW standout came over to WWE just before the invasion and, as a member of Team WWF, beat Kidman to win his first Cruiserweight title on the October 22, 2001 Raw. The company had very little interest in doing anything with the belt, which took over from the light heavyweight championship and the Japanese buzzsaw only defended it a handful of times on TV. Crash, The Hurricane and Billy Kidman all stared at the ceiling for Tajiri, but when the title became SmackDown exclusive following the draft, it was put back on Kidman's shoulders. Tajiri, though he held the title for 163 days, did a lot of jobs to other stars and even challenged for other titles, though he never defended his own on pay-per-view. 16 days after dropping it to Kidman, he won it back in a spirited match at Backlash. Kidman didn't win the rematch, nor did he get it back on a second attempt. But on the other third of that triple threat match, the Hurricane did, ending Tajiri's run at 24 days. The former ECW World Television Champion had to wait close to 18 months to find it back in his possession. A heel once again, he defeated Rey Mysterio to start his final reign, which lasted a not too shabby 95 days, and saw successful defenses against Kidman, Noble, and Mysterio before the masked man regained it on the first SmackDown of 2004. Number 6. Billy Kidman From a doped-up member of Raven's flock to the teen heartthrob in a white vest, Kidman emerged as one of WCW's breakout stars in the late 90s. He beat Juventud Guerrera to win his first of seven Cruiserweight titles on the September 14, 1998 episode of Monday Nitro. Over the course of the next 62 days, Billy Big Bollocks beat Disco Inferno, Chavo Guerrero, Psychosis, Lenny Lane, and Kaz Hayashi, while he fought Jericho and Mysterio to draws. Hoovy took the title back on the November 16th Nitro, but it was Hot Potato back Billy's way in another standout match at World War III just five days later. Kidman would almost double the length of his first reign with a 112-day spell that saw defenses against Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, Psychosis, Lash LaRue, Lodi, Chavo Guerrero, and others in singles and multi-man matches. Mysterio took it from him, but those filthy animals had a mutual respect and teamed up to win the WCW Tag Team titles just two weeks 
later. A one day reign that bridged two house shows in March of 2000 was his last with WCW's version of the Cruiserweight title, but he would hold it again very soon after coming to WWE for the invasion. Kidman captured the title twice in 2001 and twice in 2002, with standout matches coming against Tajiri, Noble and Matt Hardy. Married Tori Wilson and a seven time Cruiserweight champion, Billy Kidman lived all my teenage fantasies at once. Now if you tell me he got to meet Mr. Blobby, I swear down. Number 5. Chris Jericho Like many a directionless high flyer of the era, the Cruiserweight title gave Chris Jericho a sense of purpose. After beating Six on that house show streamed over some newfangled thing called the internet, he'll never catch on. Jericho's first reign saw defenses against Juventud Guerrera, Alex Wright and Ultimo Dragon before the dancing German won it on an episode of Nitro. 18 days later, he got it back on WCW Saturday night and went on a bit of a tear, seeing off Guerrero's Eddie Chavo and even Hector, along with Yuji Nagata and Brad Armstrong before Eddie beat him for it in a clinic at Full Brawl. A couple of solid reigns there, but the best was yet to come, because the next time he would hold the gold, he would be an altogether different Chris Jericho. Beating an injured Rey Mysterio to kick off reign number three at Sold Out 1998, Jericho really began to ramp it up as an obnoxious, overbearing heel. Not simply content with just beating everyone in the division, he also felt the need to take Juventud's mask and give Malenko such a crisis of confidence that he took off for a couple of months. The Man of a Thousand Holds return at Slamboree was an all-timer as he won a battle royal whilst disguised as Luchador Cyclope and then beat Jericho for the title, much to the delight of the fans in attendance. Only WCW didn't see that as fair, and Jericho ended up beating Malenko in a rematch for the vacated title at the Great American Bash, then held onto the gold despite ostensibly losing it to Mysterio at Bash at the Beach due to the Iceman's interference. Confused yet? Good, me too. Y2J's reign of terror finally came to an end thanks to Juventud Guerrera at Road Wild, but Jericho had shown over the course of the previous eight months that, if given the chance and a title, he could be one of the most entertaining performers performers in the entire business. Number 4. Chavo Guerrero See, there is one thing that Chavo Guerrero was better at than his uncle. Because whereas Eddie had just the two relatively short reigns with the Cruiserweight title, his nephew had six, clocking in at 431 days in total. The man formerly known as Lieutenant Loco won his first on the December 4th 2000 edition of Nitro when he beat Mike Sanders. Chavo was really starting to come into his own as a performer around this time, and he defended the title well against Courageous, Noble, Helms, Crowbar, and Mysterio, before losing it to Sugar Shane at Greed, WCW's last ever pay-per-view. He would have to wait a little while to get it back in WWE, finally defeating Rey Mysterio for the privilege in a typically gripping match at No Way Out 2004. Naturally, Eddie went and upstaged him by beating Brock Lesnar for the WWE title later that night, but Chavo defended it against Spike, Ultimo Dragon, Noble and Nunzio on television, as well as in a gauntlet-style match at WrestleMania 20. The whole losing it to Jacqueline, only to win it back, only to then accidentally lose it to his own dad ordeal, was a distraction, but Chavo got back on track by beating the plucky Paul London in the final match of a gauntlet at No Way Out 2005. He only managed the one televised defense against Funaki before London took the gold in a battle royal. But guess what happened at No Way Out 2007? That's right, our man walked away with the strap after prevailing in yet another gauntlet-style match. Despite holding the title for 153 days and putting it up for grabs at house shows, he only defended it once on TV. Evidently, WWE had pretty much given up on the championship at this point, a suspicion that was confirmed when Hornswoggle ended Chavo's reign and became what turned out to be the final title holder. Regardless of how his final reign ended, the title just looked like it belonged on Guerrero and he was one of the most credible champions in the belt's history. Number 3. Gregory Helms the last cruiserweight champion in WCW history, Sugar Shane Helms beat Chavo Guerrero to nab the honor at WCW's last ever pay-per-view. He brought the title with him to the Fed for the invasion, where he promptly lost it to Billy Kidman. Given the downtime between WCW closing and the alliance forming, those 109 days are a tad misleading. Almost a year later, Helms would win the title back from Tajiri, only this time he was doing it as the Hurricane. The Cage Crusader would only manage 
one defense against Chavo Guerrero before falling to Jamie Noble at the King of the Ring, ending his second reign at 38 days. So, at this point, you're probably wondering what got Helms to the lofty heights of third on our countdown. Or perhaps you're not. Perhaps you've fallen asleep in front of the laptop again. Don't worry, I won't take it personally, but I will let you in on why. After dropping the hurricane shtick and turning heel, Gregory Helms switched brands and entered himself into a cruiserweight open at the 2006 Royal Rumble, winning the title for a third time and kicking off a mammoth 384-day reign of the single longest in the title's history by more than double the second most. Though he suffered non-title losses against bigger stars on the blue brand, Helms was a fighting champion and had several notable matches on TV and pay-per-view. When he was eliminated during the gauntlet at No Way Out 2007, it really felt like it meant something because Helms had made the title mean something. Number 2. Dean Malenko The second WCW Cruiserweight Champion ever, Dean Malenko defeated Shinjiro Atani on an episode of Worldwide, beginning a 66-day reign that really set the tone for what the title would be going forward. Bouts with Brad Armstrong, Disco Inferno, and um, hard work Bobby Walker were all well and good, but it was a certain masked phenomenon known as Rey Mysterio Jr. that would give the man of a thousand holds his first great rivalry in WCW. Dean defeated Rey in Mysterio's scintillating WCW debut at the 1996 Great American Bash, then again on Nitro, but the third time was the charm for the luchador. That wasn't the end of their feud, of course, and Malenko beat Mysterio in another blinder to regain the title at Halloween Havoc. Dean then put it up against anyone and everyone, from Jim Powers and Scotty Riggs to Jimmy Graffiti and David Sammartino. Quite the illustrious list, no? There were also defenses against Psychosis, Hooventude, Kidman, and Jericho before J Crown champion Ultimo Dragon unseated Malenko at Starcade. He won it back 24 days later, held it for another 32, and lost it to six before turning his attention toward the US title instead. A year later, Malenko would have his classic feud with Jericho and another short reign, which ended when WCW vacated the belt after deciding Dean hadn't won it himself, even if he had been defending it for the best part of a month. An expert technician in amongst a sea of those who preferred to take to the skies, Dean Malenko stood out from the crowd and provided fans with some of the best cruiserweight title matches in memory. And just look how happy that makes him. Number 1. Rey Mysterio One of the best cruiserweights ever. No, wait, scratch that. One of the best luchadors ever. No, wait, scratch that too. One of the best professional wrestlers of all time. Yeah, that sounds more like it. Rey Mysterio can also rightly call himself the best cruiserweight champion ever, too. Nobody has more than his eight reigns, and nobody put on as many classic matches either while holding or in pursuit of the title. Exploding onto the global stage at the 1996 Great American Bash, Ray may have been massively undersized by US standards of the era, but he won over the fans and skeptics in the locker room with his revolutionary displays. No surprise then that he would take home the cruiserweight title five times while working working for the promotion. In those three years, he had incredible matches with an eclectic mix of challengers, whether he held the title for 114 days, his fifth and longest reign, or eight days, his third and shortest. In WWE, he won his first Cruiserweight title from Matt Hardy in that prestigious SmackDown main event, defended it against Hardy, Nunzio, and Tajiri before losing it to the Japanese buzzsaw, the man he won it back from to kick off his seventh reign in early 2004. Chavo Jr. took it from him at No Way Out, but Ray took it away from Chavo Classic a few months later. The sole televised defense from this final reign was a hidden gem against Chavo Jr. at the Great American Bash. Ray held the Cruiserweight title for 400 176 combined days, spanning his time as a skinny newcomer to a filthy animal to his remastered re-emergence as a fully-fledged WWE superstar. 36 people held the Cruiserweight Championship, some of them legends in their own right. But there is only, and there will only ever be, one Rey Mysterio, the greatest Cruiserweight Champion there ever was.